The following is a recording of Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. For more information, visit gpts.edu. Well, we got a bunch of questions. I'm thankful for that. I was told to be ready for some of my own. And uh, I was like, uh, was the, the bug, bunny that goes, you know, I didn't know what I was going to say. Actually, I had a couple, but we got some excellent questions here. I'm going to begin with this one, and there's a backstory here, and I don't know what it is, but it's for you, Dr. Piper. And the question is, I'm sorry. Now says, please ask your Dr. Piper. Dr. Piper, did Dr. Fesco convince you? Please explain why or why not. I knew that was going to happen. Well, we, we agree essentially in almost everything except what you're going to call it. So I'm going with the larger catechism. The covenant of grace was made with Christ in eternity. And even some of the men that use the language would refer to what Dick and Boston spoke of as the eternal aspect of the covenant of grace, as the covenant of redemption. So I thought it was really well done. I will arm us with him about uh, uh, Zechariah 6.13. But otherwise, uh, it's a glorious truth, and whichever way you're going to phrase it. It's why I pointed out in my lecture today is that if, uh, if Ware and Grudem understood that doctrine, we might not be having the problems we're having with them today. All right. Um, and whatever student did that, I'm going to get you. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Fesco, what are the distinctions between the covenant of redemption and the eternal covenant of grace? <laughs> are they truly serious differences or are we talking against each other? Um, I think to answer that question, to echo Dr. Piper's sentiments, there's a sense in which there's a large-scale agreement on the broader issues, uh, you know, so that you can have somebody like Patrick Gillespie, who will call it the covenant of redemption, but then conversely you can have somebody like Thomas Boston, who will talk about it more in terms of the, if I can put it this way, the eternal pole of the covenant of grace. And so they're, they're talking about very similar realities uh, but that being said, um, I think that, I don't know, I, I like to keep my peas and my carrots separate. Uh, and so I like to distinguish the covenant of redemption as that covenant which God makes with Christ and, and the Holy Spirit to distinguish that from the covenant of grace. I think that that's a helpful distinction. I know some Great minds, even sitting on this platform, you know, would want to state it slightly differently. But that's where I think that we can say that, you know, despite whatever differences there are, I think we can both, you know, hold those positions charitably towards one another without, you know, saying that it's, it's any kind of error. It's perhaps a preference. But I would just, I think that it's better in light of a number of those texts that I, you know, alluded to and cited, uh, you know, because they speak in that manner. So, I don't know, hopefully that, that answers that question. Then for Dr. Fleur, uh, you referenced Nikki Cruz's testimony to establish the importance of the Trinity for understanding, knowing the gospel in an experimental manner. How can we share the gospel in a distinctively Trinitarian way? Listen, I can just talk. Can y'all hear me okay? Is everyone okay? All right, there we go. Um, I, I, that's a great question, and I think the thing, here we go. Okay, we got it off. There we go. Uh, one of the ways, I'll just share from my own experience of, of doing this, is if we are doing what Cruz experienced, and I, I put it that way intentionally, which is living our lives in a Trinitarian way, knowing God in a Trinitarian way, it's going to spill over in how we talk about him in every aspect of our lives, including evangelism. So I don't have like four steps to make yourself a Trinitarian evangelist. What I would say is when we share the gospel, we need to talk about who God is. 
We need to talk about what he requires, and we need to talk about how sinners cannot meet that requirement, and that takes us straight to the son, the son of who? The son of the father. And the only way you're going to believe in this son is if the spirit gives you the faith to believe in this son. So you need to cry out to this God who is father, son, and Holy Spirit. And oh, by the way, if you do cry out, he will save you. And when you come to know him, you will know the father through the son in the power of the spirit. And so I think that everything we do, nuclear to everything we do, has to be this full-orbed Trinitarian relationship with God in our own hearts before we can give that away, as it were. Dr. Piper, can you address the name God in the New Testament, Theos, and how we are to understand it? Is it always referring to God the Father? And the second, how does a Christian pray? Can we pray to the Son or to the Spirit or into the Spirit? Okay. Um, I think that when the Spirit gives us the name God by itself, we should always think of the triune God. If the name God is used in a context where either the Son or the Spirit or both are being referred to, then we think of God as Father. So that's a pretty simplistic way, but I think that's what the Spirit does. Uh, so by itself, it's the, it's, he is the triune God. In the context of one or both of the others, then it's a reference to the Father. With respect to praying, our primary uh, address in prayer, as we're taught by the Savior, is to God as Father. But particularly when it has to do with the, the uh, distinctive works of the other two persons, then it's not improper to address them as well, particularly according to things that we've been promised that they are doing in us and for us. All right, this one's to any of you. Um, I'll begin with... Uh, uh, well, I'll just let which one of you jump out. There's a good question. Given the conference focus on the Trinity and given the equality in essence of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, does much of Christian, Christendom err in devoting so much of our focus in prayer, study, and song on Jesus, seemingly relegating the Father and the Spirit to roles of secondary importance? Um, I'm going to give a definitive yes and no uh, response uh, to that question. Um, does it diminish the roles of the Father and the Spirit when we focus upon the Son? Um, we can if we do so, if we kind of just make Christ the sole object of worship as if there is no Father and is no Son. I would have to, we'd have to get into specifics to say who are we talking about, where, where are the examples of this? But I think no, from the vantage point to remember, uh, there you know there's a couple, there's a, an important Trinitarian term that's called the uh, inseparable operations, the inseparable operations of the Triune God, and the way that this is said, and I'll uh, I'll avoid abusing you with the Latin, uh, but it's the external work of the Trinity is indivisible, uh, in the sense that when you are looking at the Son, this is the Son that the Father sent. So to see the Son is to see the Father sending him. Uh, but then on the, on the flip side of that too, this is also the Christ. And I tell my, my students this, Christ isn't his last name, uh, as sometimes we you know, you know, get the impression, but Christ means anointed. And then you want to ask the question, with what is he anointed or by whom is he anointed? And that's with the Holy Spirit. So when you look at Christ, you're looking at the Father sent Spirit anointed Savior. You know, so there's a sense in which if you're reading Scripture carefully, even if you're looking at the Son, you will always see Father, Son, and Holy Spirit because of those what you call inseparable operations. Can people unduly or perhaps erroneously box out the Father and the Spirit? Yes. But, uh, you know, we shouldn't do that. And so, to wit, I think a perfect example of this is that in the 19th, late 19th century, you had Charles Briggs, a liberal, uh, you know, Presbyterian theologian, 
who was trying to push for the, uh, the, the, uh, the changing of the Westminster Standards because he says it's deficient, there's no chapter on the Holy Spirit. If he were here today, I would say, have you read chapter 8 of the Confession? That's on Christology. Have you read chapter 8 of the Confession? There's so much mentioned about the work of the Spirit that, you know, you can't ignore it almost. And then as B.B. Warfield said, they're not, there's not one chapter on the Spirit. There's like 19 chapters on the Holy Spirit as it talks about the application of the work of redemption. So keeping those things in mind, I think you can say that you can look at Christ and God willing see the, the work of the triune God, even if you just see Christ in the pages of Scripture. I, I don't know if you guys want to add to that. Oh, just one thing. I, I think it's a big danger in the parachurch organizations. When I was uh, a senior in seminary before a Reformed Baptist corrected my ecclesiology, I was about to go and staff one of those organizations. And um, I was down on a beach project uh, in Daytona. I guess that might give something away. But anyway... Uh, I was sent to write a, an evaluation of it. And the one thing that bugged me the whole time I was there, it was just all Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And uh, there wasn't a whole gospel being proclaimed because of that. Uh, I would think the, the four laws, whatever they call, call it now, it would be, be quite similar. And as well as a lot of the, quote, quote modern praise music. Um, there's a great lack of Trinitarianism uh, in uh, most of what, Contemporary churches are getting around and doing now. A follow up: um, We've been talking about the confession, so back to you, Doctor Fesco. Do you believe the Westminster Confession of Faith teaches a covenant of redemption without using the term? Please explain. I say yes. <laughs> sure. Um, y yes, uh, and I, I put it forward a couple of things. One is that. Uh, the sum of saving knowledge, uh, which was uh, included and bound with the Westminster Standards when they were adopted by the Scottish Presbyterian Church, they saw that these two kind of went hand in hand. So they didn't see any conflict where they explicitly uh, mention the, the covenant of redemption uh, in the sum of saving knowledge. So they said, hey, this is a summary of the Westminster Standards. So from the earliest days uh, of, of the use of the confession, they've seen the two as being compatible uh, second point is that in the Savoy Declaration, which is the congregational version of the, uh, the Westminster uh, Standards or Westminster Confession of Faith, and it was largely tweaked at times by uh, John Owen and Thomas Goodwin, Goodwin who was at the assembly. Um, they, in chapter 8, when it says that the Father appointed the Son, they added a phrase in there that says, by way of covenant. You know, so in other words, I think that what they were trying to do is draw out what was materially present. Does that mean, therefore, that you know, somebody that doesn't affirm uh, the covenant of redemption is somehow out of accord with the standards? No, I don't think so. I think it just means that, you know, substantively, at least, we're talking about the same thing. If we want to differ over the terminology, then, 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 okay, we can differ over the terminology. Uh, and so that's why I see that at least somebody like a Boston and a Gillespie, though they're talking different terms, I think substantively they're, they're, they're pretty much saying the same thing, although, you know, there's some slight differences in nuance there. So uh, that's, that's the way to answer that question. Okay. Um, this is says to anyone, but I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Fleur. Can you please advise how to succinctly explain to others the ontological equality of the three persons of the Godhead and the submission of Jesus in the Spirit to the Father? In the Godhead, there be three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the same in power. No, I'm, I'm, see, it's same in substance, equal in power and glory. Yeah, I don't think we can get beyond the confessional definition there, but I think what we want to explain to people is that when God, this is where, again, what Dr. Fesco talked about, like, people say this is abstract. Well, here comes the, the legs. If you didn't get them up there, here, there's more to it right here. The very fact that God sends the Son tells us that there is something more at work here than either just Jesus not being fully God, which is the answer of people who deny the deity of Christ, or that it just kind of happened, that, you know, God all of a sudden wanted to save sinners, and so he sent Jesus. No, there's a covenantal language. He comes to us wrapped in the covenant, as Dr. Fesco put it. 
so that when we talk about um, the ontological equality, and if you don't know what that word ontological means, it's, it means at the level of being. So Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are the same in substance, equal in power and glory. Okay, so there's not, God's, the Father is not more God than God the Son or God the Spirit. So that's what we mean by ontology. But then when you talk about the, the submission of the Son, it's voluntary and it happens because of the covenant of redemption. That's why Jesus voluntarily did that. So I think the doctrine of the covenant of redemption really helps us answer that question in terms of giving us a framework for understanding why the Son and the Spirit do what they do in the work of redemption. Okay, Dr. Piper. The questioner says, I've come across authors who write about the Trinity as paradigmatic, paradigmatic for family relationships. Will you comment on, comment on whether this is correct or incorrect and why? Obviously, you missed the lecture this morning. <laughs> um, basically, no, it's not correct. It's not a good paradigm. And I think that uh, what they have argued from... 1 Corinthians 11.3, that uh, as it comes up, as the Son, as uh, Christ is in submission to uh, God, uh, they're failing to understand what was just said, that Christ is a title uh, for the, the Messianic God-man. Uh, and so there's plenty of Scripture, as I said this morning, to enforce uh, the, the Genesis 2 mandate that God has created, that I mentioned this morning, there's two problems today before the church, Trinitarianism and sexuality. And uh, Peter Van Dudeward mentioned something to me a few weeks ago. He said, we basically, in the OPC and the PCA, have the same root problem. It goes two different directions. In the OPC, there are people who do not want to admit that there's created ontological differences between men and women. And in the PCA, we've got side B, homosexuality. It's right back to the same thing. Uh, are, are there God-created, ordained, uh, ontological differences? And so the Scripture addresses all of that, and all we're doing is abusing the doctrine of the Trinity. After my lecture this morning, uh, Rick Phillips mentioned to me, and I, I, I agree with this, it's, at the end of the day, what they're doing, they're using all the, the uh, text for uh, the economic relationships in the Trinity. And that's what Arius did, exactly what Jehovah's Witnesses do. And they're turning everything in Scripture that talks about the will of the Son and everything else into an eternal uh, relationship. And so it's not a good pattern. In fact, if somebody said to me after the lecture this morning, well, actually, the Trinity is egalitarian. <laughs> and the Trinity is egalitarian. Um, so God gave us in the in the scriptures, and there's plenty of passages that speak to these relationships, and we are biblically bound to obey them. But we don't use the Trinity for it. At least I don't. Dr. Fesco, in what respect is the Spirit a party of the covenant of redemption? It depends on who you ask. Um, and, you know, in the history of the doctrine, there are two major variants. Uh, there's one bit variant, and you see this one, say, for example, with, uh, uh, I think it's uh, Samuel Rutherford, who was one of the Westminster divines, who says that the, uh, the spirit was not at all involved in the covenant of redemption. At first blush, that sounds really bad, and it perhaps at least feeds into the, uh, the uh, impression that, boy, that sounds binitarian, just in other words, two members of the Trinity and not Trinitarian. Uh, so that's problematic. Uh, then on the other side of the coin, you have some who say that uh, the, the Spirit is involved in the covenant of redemption, and that would be somebody like uh, a Herman Bovink, for example, who would you know have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In the history of the doctrine, the Trinitarian formulation is the, in the minority report. Uh, I don't know exact percentages and numbers, but I'd guess somewhere, say, 10, 15 percent fall into that category, and the other 80, 85, whatever, 90 percent, you know, fall in the father and son category. So then all of a sudden we think, well, wait a minute, is, is this a big problem? And I say the answer to that is no, because some theologians construct the covenant of redemption as exclusively 
the appointment of the son as covenant surety, strictly as the son's appointment as covenant surety. Um, that is, we would say, so in other words, they're doing a Christological covenant of redemption. Whereas other theologians will say, no, it's a Trinitarian covenant of redemption because they have the involvement of the Trinity. Uh, I've never seen any crosstalk against either position. In other words, proponents of either position saying, oh, that's wrong or this is wrong. Again, it's, uh, if I can put it this way, it's to place a different emphasis on the other syllable. Um, you know, because th the, the proponents of the, the, the father-son covenant of redemption, they'll say, well, how does this come about? Well, somebody like an Owen will say, well, that's because there's a Trinitarian council or a concilium dei where Father, Son, and Holy Spirit say there's going to be a covenant between Father and Son to bring about the redemption of the elect. And so it's just sometimes you get some people putting certain texts and certain ideas in one category and other texts and other ideas in other categories, but more or less substantively, they're more or less saying the same thing. They're just putting slightly different labels on it. So in either formulation, neither of them are being sub-Trinitarian. It's just a different way that they're expressing it. One is Christological versus other is Trinitarian. So I hope that answers that question. A lot more good questions, but I was given clear instruction to wrap up at quarter till, and I will follow those instructions. And thank you, men, for your answers, and as well as your presentations and your lectures and sermons. Very, very profitable, and I think we're all going home with a lot to chew on, and we praise the Lord for that. Um, we're dismissed until we come back at 7 for the evening session, and enjoy fellowship with one another as you go. Thank you for tuning in to this production of Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. For more information, please visit gpts.edu.